Hi, my name's Sarah Webster. I'm volunteering with Centro Feto Haburas Desenvolvimento, aka CEFADE, in Timor Leste as a project officer. CEFADE is a really small um, grassroots women's organisation in Baokau, which is in rural Timor Leste. They work with assisting vulnerable women in the community, especially women who are survivors of violence, domestic and sexual violence. Hi, my name's Claire Parsons. I'm a volunteer with Alfella Women and Children's Legal Aid in Dili, Timor-Leste. The legal officers at Alfella work with um, victims of domestic violence and sexual abuse. Hi, my name is Kelly. I'm an avid volunteer with Pridat, uh, a local NGO in Timor-Leste. I've been here for 14 out of 18 months. Um, my role is Program Officer Mental Health. Uh, that covers a range of things from program development to monitoring and evaluation to writing uh, organisational documents in English to every day something different. I'm Anne Kennedy, volunteering with Cruz Vermilia Timor Leste as a business development officer with the Commercial First Aid Unit. My role here is to support the manager of Commercial First Aid. My advice would be prepare for things to change once you arrive in country. It's not always going to be as it's set out in the position description or perhaps as your expectations are of Timor. The tension between what the idea of these volunteer positions are and the reality of them is constantly there. It's very different. I mean, when the first assignment I looked at and I was like, my God, that's exactly my background, you know, doing monitoring and evaluation in a small NGO. In reality, that is not the kind of pressing need in credit at the moment. The pressing need is some really basic things like getting more money and uh, being able to report on the things that we do have and working with coordinators to actually plan for their program's development. Bon dia. Bon dia. There are certain aspects of my job description that's the same, and there's definitely certain aspects that are not the same. Part of my assignment description was very ambitious for the level or the time that my organisation is at. They're a very new organisation. They're only three years old and been doing programs for two years. I had a good PD, which outlined some pretty tangible targets that our fellow wanted me to achieve. But having arrived here, things have cropped up along the way. So for example, we've had to do some policy training and I've become a lot more involved in that than I have, for example, with the legal analysis work. So I've learned to be flexible and to take tasks on as they come. The way it looks on my PD is that there's only four things really I need to do and I'm thinking, what else am I gonna do for the rest of the 12 months? But when I came here and found that the unit was just newly established, the manager had just been recruited, the trainers had just been recruited, I flicked back into being manager of a training unit mode, which was one of my previous roles in Australia, and so just started working with my counterpart on a day-to-day -day basis from where he was at in his development, in his role and looking at how I could support him to build trust and build a relationship between us. It's one-on-one -on, -one on being a human, it's like you gotta build relationships. It took me about three months to observe what was actually going on in the organisation. I spent a lot of time with my TEDM dictionaries, <laughs> just reading and absorbing also talking with my colleagues um, and we also are provided with a separate language allowance so I'd certainly encourage other volunteers to make use of that because it can really help you when you first arrive in country to hit the ground running with language. Definitely most of my Tetum has come from talking to neighbours, reading newspapers and documents in Tetum and in the workplace 
they love being able to teach you the language in exchange for explaining what that means in English. So I think informal play is just as big a part as, as formal training. When I first started and I'd go to the warum next door and like everyone would sit on their table and I'd sit by myself. It's like, it's like being in primary school and having no mates. <laughs> It's not because they don't want you there, it's just you're quite, it's quite an effort to try to include someone who doesn't speak your language yet, you know. Like, so the more you learn, the faster you learn the language, the better. You think you're a lot more patient than you are. You think you would never have the kind of thoughts sometimes you have about like, what is wrong with everyone? Why don't they understand me? It's like, oh, because I don't speak their language. Yeah, that's it. I come from another culture, yeah. That's why no one understands me. It's, you know, being Australian isn't a universal kind of thing. It's just Australia. It does take time, but um, I find now we're able to muck around and to laugh and um, to have fun. And, and in doing that, it actually helps productivity in, in the workplace. It's really important to remember that it's OK to go slowly sometimes. It's really OK to go slow. <laughs> Like everywhere, there's layers of gender, there's layers of culture, there's layers of communication styles and the way people learn. Before I came here, I was a very task-orientated person in terms of my working style. And that's something that I've adapted to in countries, becoming more relationship-focused. So the first few months are all about building relationships. And I really don't think volunteers should be too hard on themselves about not being able to tick things off their list because you can't underestimate the importance of building trusting relationships with your colleagues. <laughs> Something that I've really enjoyed being part of the Red Cross program is the welcome that you receive in country and how willing people are to share knowledge with you about what's going on socially but also resources that might help you at work. Capacity development for me is pretty intangible concept and it's ongoing and you might be trying really hard to capacity build but you don't necessarily see the results until months down the track. So part of my role here at Alfella is to review and develop a new case management system. So that system um, is about how lawyers open files right to the file closure and all the steps along the way. Introducing the concept of keeping a really thorough physical file has been a bit of a challenge, but my colleagues have all been very enthusiastic about it and we're doing some more training on that shortly. I have a bit of a problem with the concept of capacity building. Um, well, not with the concept of it, but the way that the term is used in development. Information sharing would be a better way of talking about it because Quite frankly, I'm learning as much as they are in my organisation, you know, like, and it's a two-way street. And without learning from people in my organisation, there's no way I can share my skills with them. I see capacity development as basically anything that will assist them to carry out the functions and aims of their organisation. It's about looking at um, where your staff want to head and what new skills they want to learn and also through your observations what skills perhaps they need in order to carry out their day-to-day -day tasks, carry out programs that they're trying to implement. It's something that I wasn't quite sure how to approach when I came and so I watched and listened for the first few days and took my cues from Mariano, my counterpart. For me, it comes in various different forms. It might be that I sit down with my colleague and we go through a document together or we go through how to write a proposal together and do that together. It can also be if I have no idea in how to do what they need, uh, outsourcing it to, to another organisation or person that I know that can come in and, um, and do that development training with them. And it's also about example. I could do all the tasks that need to get done quite easily, but that's not the point of my role. Sometimes it's really, really difficult not to do the work and to instead sort of step back and just support and let, and let uh, your colleagues do it. By nature, I'm task oriented and a driver and that could be my biggest downfall in this role. So it was also about 
helping me to channel myself and the way I work and working out how I could do that with my counterpart. And we early on established an agreement that if he thought I was pushing too hard in my capacity development, <laughs> that um, he would tell me, and he does. I think it's very difficult to define success and I feel like it's been constantly changing uh, every month, every week, um, depending on what's going on. For me now, I think after nine months, success to me is all the small wins. I think if my manners, my colleagues feel like they've learned something new, they feel like their organisation is heading in the right direction, if they feel like they're stronger than um, they were, say, last year, then that's successful. that's successful for me, yeah. What I'd really like to see by the end of my placement is um, staff having ownership over their activities, you know, like feeling like not only that they're doing something that's valuable, but they understand the link between what they're doing and what they want to see in their clients. And there's many challenges to women and children accessing the formal justice system here in Timor. And sometimes that can be disheartening. But on the other hand, I think it's important to look back and see how far things have come. And Timor is still a very new nation and its judicial institutions are still young and growing in their capacity. But every day, you know, you'll see things progressing and you'll hear about cases where a good result has been achieved. I get really proud of my host organisation. Um, over some big things and also some small things. I get really proud when I see my boss, say in a rural area, challenge um, politely, but still challenge a chief of a village about women's rights, about why times have changed now. I will readily admit that I think I've had the dream assignment. Things have gone, I think, really well, and we've achieved a lot, and I think we've worked well together. I mean, I'd come back to the same organisation if I could. I'd come... I particularly want to do it now because I've bloody learned the language and now I'm going to go home. It feels like there's a lot of momentum at the moment. It's sad to move away from that. Um, I believe that, like, the organisation has a really important role in Timor. It's just, it's important work. I think sometimes we have a tendency to measure success by tangible things that, you know, very task orientated. But for me here in Timor, um, I think a great measure of success is the close and trusting relationships that I've built with my colleagues and the way that we are able to work together. The other great thing on a personal level is it's been a really big challenge but overall a really great one from living uh, by myself to learning a new language to joining a new office that functions really differently from Australia has been really wonderful.